Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Rebel Stoke Baptist. Uh, it's awesome to have you with us. Uh, just a couple of announcements before we get started. Um, first is just uh, for this morning, actually, after the service or uh, after the message, uh, we're going to be taking communion together. So i uh, just like to encourage you to have your, uh, uh, the, your bread and your wine or your juice ready. And uh, after the service, uh, we can all do that together. Um, another announcement is um, this Wednesday, uh, Wednesday night at 7 p.m., we're going to have another Zoom online prayer meeting. So um, we've everybody in the directory, um, we've sent uh, invitation to with a link to Zoom. So um, for to get into the meeting. Um, so if if you're on on here and you haven't got a message yet for that or you would like to be part of our prayer meeting please let me know um, or arlene and we can send you an invitation for that as well and so uh just kind of uh a reminder to when when you log into that make sure whatever you're logging in from that you have an actual mic and a camera uh, in your computer or your tablet or your phone or whatever you're using just so we can hear and see you um, sometimes I know when certain people have uh, joined up, it was a little bit tricky. Um, sometimes the video doesn't hitch up or things like that, but most of the time it works. And if your video is not working and we can hear you, that's great too. You know, we're all just praying together. So uh, it'd be great to have you. So Wednesday at 7, so even like five minutes, between five minutes to 7 and 7, or a couple minutes after, uh, just feel free to click on the link and follow the instructions through. Um, and then, yeah, hopefully it all works. It worked last time, so uh, excited to see you there. Okay, if you have a Bible, um, please open up to the book of Isaiah, chapter 11. And um, yeah, as we do that, I'm just, I just kind of, you know, was thinking about this. Sometimes I'm just preaching to a camera here, but... Uh, I forget that you all are at home and you're in various scenarios and a lot of you have kids as we do and you might have toddlers running around and, and it's kind of chaotic and, and, uh, and so I just want to say uh, I feel your pain <laughs> and I know, I know the struggle is real so that's all good. You just do your best and forget the rest and uh, you know that's part of the thing of dealing with where we're at right now. Uh, it's, it's not ideal but... Um, why don't we all just do our best right now to have a, 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 a kind of a, a, a scenario where we can all just have our hearts rest and our minds be able to think. And so we're going we're gonna to look at Isaiah chapter 11, a pretty awesome, hopeful chapter. And ask, before we look at it, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for today. God, I just thank you for your word. And I'm so thankful that we have the book of Isaiah, God, and we can dive into it. Sometimes it feels like it's diving into the deep end and a lot of things are hard to figure out, but it's your word and it's so amazing. And I just pray and ask for your mercy. That you would grant us mercy in looking at your word and that you would by your spirit, open up our hearts and open up our minds and help us not to be, you know, worried with the things of the world, but God, that you'd help us to focus on the, the final end game and to focus on Jesus and, and to run the race hard and, and that we would just see you and we wouldn't get distracted by all this kind of garbage and stuff that's going on to the left and the right of us these days. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's read Isaiah chapter 11, starting in verse 1. There shall come forth a little green shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel, and of might, the spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. Actually, just going to pause there for one second, just as an aside here. I don't really talk about this too much today, but but it's interesting how Isaiah 
actually talks about the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament a lot. And it's kind of a, an interesting thing that we're going to pick up as we go along through Isaiah. It's, it's something that you most often think of as teachings from the New Testament, but here we see it in uh, the prophecy of Isaiah. Verse 3 says, And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. And he's not going to judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth, it's talking about Jesus, with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waif waste and faithfulness the belt of his loins and the wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together and the little child shall lead them the cow and the bear shall graze and their young shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox can you imagine a lion eating eating hay. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. Verse 10, In that day the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal, for the peoples of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. Okay, so last week we, we kind of did just sort of like a primer of this passage and looked at the first few verses, just the first few verses. And, and one of the things we were looking at the most is the fact that not tethering yourself to Jesus is not a good place to be in life. Or, or to look at it this way, that not following Jesus or not uh, having a life that's detached from your own creator is not the kind of life that contains any sort of hope or freedom. And I know a lot of people will disagree with that, but this is the actual truth as spoken from God. And, and remember that illustration we had last week of an astronaut like an astronaut who detaches and uncouples himself as he's working on the space station and he pushes off out into deep space. And when you're, you're spinning around like this astronaut, you're spinning around going out into deep space and, and you're totally detached from the space station in just your space suit, there might be kind of like a hallucination or a delusion of having some sort of freedom just because you freed yourself from the space station, but sooner or later, you're going to face a big-time problem. And this problem is that space is not friendly to you. It's not friendly or conducive to life at all. There's no air in space. There's no streams of water. There's no food. And uh, in the same way, we need to realize that um, there's no life. There is no real, true life and being detached from Jesus. You know, in, in this life, as we go along, sooner or later, all of us are going to realize that we're going to come face to face with the problem of evil and the problem of sin and the effects of sin. And, and this is a problem that, that affects us all in so many ways. You don't have to look very far to find the problem of evil in this world. There's, there's violence. Think about the last century just even the last century on this earth is just violence, 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 or abuse. The powerful abusing the weak on a grand scale or a personal scale. Oppression, disease, injustice, deception, sadness. Sadness is a, is a result of the problem of evil. Despair and darkness and loneliness. And in the end, most of all, is the problem that none of us can escape. Death. <clears throat> and you know, most of the, the world, and in the entire world, I think, but especially in our culture, we 
all try to drown out the problem of evil in our lives. Nobody likes thinking about death. Nobody does. And uh, no one likes to be sad. And so what we often do is we try and distract ourselves. We, we go and binge something on Netflix. And we go and play video games. I'm guilty of both those things. We start thinking about new purchases, what we want to buy on Amazon or, or, or what we're working towards in life. Or, or, or else we go and we, in our careers or our work, we try and throw ourselves into our work to distract ourselves. Or, or we go and pursue some other relationship. We make plans. We go and decide, I'm going to renovate my house. And we just never, ever, ever stop thinking about the next big thing in our lives. That's what we do. It's we... we we distract ourselves from what's actually really going on in this world. And, uh, you know, none more good example than just every day coming home from work and uh, scrolling through a phone on Facebook, sometimes for hours. And, and all we do is we gain nothing from that. We gain zero things from scrolling through our phone except distraction. It's actually temporary distraction and you know now when i say this i'm not trying to criticize or whatever because there's nothing wrong with any of these things in and of themselves but you know i think most of us could admit the truth of that about distraction and especially during covid and and i really feel that right now i feel like the whole world is really desperate right now to try and distract itself from what's going on you know, online services like Netflix and Amazon Prime and, and Crave and all those and, and the video game makers, they're all having record years of profit. 2020 was their biggest year. And, uh, you know, for us, I totally get it. I understand it. You know, we're trying to, we, we default to that. We try and occupy our minds with entertainment and, and whatever, all kinds of different things if it's not entertainment because thinking and worrying about COVID or just even just the plain feeling of loneliness or feeling depressed. Those things don't feel good. They don't feel good. And, and you know, I, I, but I would guess for many of you this morning who are tuning in, you know, you can already see the pointlessness of trying to distract yourself. It's not like I'm, I'm trying to preach something new. You know, it's it, how pointless it is to try and distract ourselves from a broken world. And a lot of us, you know, as, as distract as we might, that the, the reality of brokenness and evil breaks in and, and assaults us in our life. And, you know, I was just thinking about in this last year, many of us, in, in our church, all of us have had to, to say goodbye to someone that we know and love. You know, we said goodbye to a sweet, strong pillar of a lady in our church, Melanie Melnick. I said goodbye to my Uncle Jim. My dad, that's my dad's brother. My dad said goodbye to his brother. We said goodbye. I said goodbye to my dear, close friend, Vera. And, uh, you know, I know grief and sadness doesn't feel good. But you know, it's okay to feel like that. And uh, uh, for some reason, I think we all feel like we need to cover up those feelings in our heart and our mind and, and try and push them down and just get on with life. But you know, it's okay. It's actually good to feel the feels. God gave us these emotions and you know in some ways I think emotions can be incredibly honest for us I mean a lot of ways I know emotions can deceive us in certain things you know um, I won't get into that but in some ways they can be incredibly honest because they let us know the truth about what's going on in the world when we, especially when we feel sadness they, they, they let us know the truth that, that things are are not right. Things aren't the way that they should be. You know, when we, when we lose somebody in our life, we feel wronged inside. We feel hurt. Because deep down, we know 
that person should be with us forever. That's what we feel. We just feel like it's so wrong that they're not with us anymore. And, you know, I believe that it's really good. It's good to cry. You know, Jesus cried, and it's normal to, to feel that raw pain in your heart and, and grief. But, you know, this morning, what I would like to remind you, Christians, is something that the Apostle Paul said in, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.13. He says, we don't grieve. We're not sad like the rest of mankind who has no hope. That's not us. There's a difference in our grief. There's a difference in sadness and grief of the person who has their life tethered to Jesus and the person who, who isn't. And I've, I've seen this all throughout my life, and I've witnessed it so clearly in funerals. There's the difference between the funeral of the person who's followed Christ and, and who has friends and family who are followers of Christ and, and the difference between that funeral and the funeral of people who just, they, they don't have anything to do with Jesus in their life. You know, both funerals are same. And in some ways, both funerals have tears. Both have grief. But only one of those funerals has hope. And this is what our passage speaks about today. Not just hope like, oh, I hope something is going to happen and we're going to float on a cloud somewhere. Not like that. Not like a wish and a prayer. A hope that's like anchored in to the promise of our creator. The promise of God. The promise of Jesus. The man Jesus Christ. And it says in prophesying about Isaiah 11, it says, he is somebody who has faithfulness and righteousness for his belt and i just want to actually i think maybe we should set our hearts on on that because it ties in for just a moment to think about this attribute of jesus something that just mentions here so quickly that he is faithful that jesus is faithful and so often i think we breeze over when, when you say Jesus is faithful, you know, yeah, yeah, of course he is. And we breeze over, maybe because we think it just sounds Christian y and it, it just people always say stuff like that. But we got to think that word through. Because I think faithfulness in our culture, it's like a throwaway word. You know, it uh, doesn't mean a whole lot, in my opinion, because every day in Canada, loads and loads of people make promises in marriage to be faithful to one another. And every day, those promises of faithfulness are broken in the thousands. You know, we, we see this because uh, you can just look at the stats. And, uh, you know, marriages, I know, they end for the, a lot of myriad of different reasons. It's not just all because of unfaithfulness. But my guess is that when a partner is not faithful to another partner, that's one of the top reasons. That's my guess. Uh, and I think it's a pretty good guess that one of the top reasons is unfaithfulness for marriages ending. But, you know, when we, we think about faithful, when we read here about Jesus, an attribute is, is that he is faithful. We've got to be careful not to superimpose our own experiences on that word. Jesus is totally faithful in, in, in that. That's part of his nature. That's who he is. He can't change it. And, and we know if God has made a promise, Jesus is God. If God has made a promise, then he will be 100% truthful and honest and dependable to carry out that promise in all its fullness. That's because he is faithful to us in the most pure and godly way. And I hope you believe that. I hope you can, can come to believe that. Even if you've had people break faithfulness in your life, don't superimpose that on God. He's not like those other people. And, and you know, this is our hope. Our hope is based upon promises alluded to in Isaiah 11. That God 
in Jesus Christ is going to put a full stop and end to evil. God in Jesus Christ is going to erase evil with extreme prejudice from the universe. Look at verse 4. Remember, this is prophesying Jesus. Verse 4, second half of verse 4, I should say, says, and he, let's talk about Jesus, and he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips, he shall kill the wicked. Let me just read that again. He, Jesus, going to strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips, he shall kill the wicked. And, and I don't know about you, but when we read that, maybe you cringe and, and you think, ooh, that's not the Jesus I remember learning about in Sunday school on those planograph uh, picture boards, the storyboards. You know, Jesus isn't like kind of docile and just discipling the disciples right now. He almost sounds kind of scary. And um, this actually reminds me of a number of years ago when I lived in Vancouver and I was going to film school and I uh, had a, a roommate, Nathan, uh, that I lived with in, in Vancouver in a basement suite. And back then, you know, we didn't have smartphones because uh, they didn't exist yet. Uh, we didn't have a computer. And yes, the, it wasn't that long ago. Um, computers did exist when I went to film school. But we just couldn't afford one. And, and we had this junky old TV from the 70s that it could only pick up one fuzzy channel on the antenna. And so we found other, lots of other things to do in life. You know, not everything's about screens. And, but sometimes for when we were tired and after school, and there was a certain night of the week, um, I don't remember what it was, but on uh, one of the AM channels, they would have uh, these old um, stories, like these old detective fiction stories or or superhero stories on the radio that were that were recorded and and they would play back they were right from back in the 40s and 50s and one was called the shadow maybe you've heard that one and one of the other ones I remember uh, was Superman that was on all the time and I remember this being really funny kind of funny and interesting to us because Superman in these old radio shows his personality was quite a bit different than is in the movies now and, um, you know, I don't know. I, I kind of just, when I see Superman in the movies now, he's very quiet and, and uh, you know, kind of regal and, and soft-spoken and things like that. Um, but in that old uh, radio show, he was kind of scary. Superman was scary. And uh, you could tell in those old episodes that Superman really wanted to get rid of crime and evil. And he would use extreme force. And even resort to terrifying the wrongdoers. And I remember one episode where it was something like there were some thieves in a car or something. And he, he grabbed this car with the thieves in it. And he flew straight up into the air, like a mile into the air. And he started shaking the car like this. And uh, terrifying the thieves and telling them he's going to throw them down to earth unless they quit their evil ways. And he was yelling at them. And uh, it's, it was kind of just funny, you know, you had to listen to it. But... We're, I was always just used to Christopher Reeve type of Superman. And Nathan and I would listen. We we're both like, whoa, Superman's scary. He means business. And, uh, you know, I kind of think it's in the same way here in Isaiah, where we see a little bit different view of Jesus. Uh, and we're used to seeing this compassionate side of Jesus. It's not like it's a different Jesus. It's just another, another side of him. When we see him striking the earth and destroying the wicked. And so part of that, you know, I look at that, I ask, what is, what is this actually talking about? What is this talking about? Verse 4 says, with the breath of his lips, he shall kill the wicked. This is actually clearly referenced in the New Testament by Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2. And uh, this is kind of a famous passage in 2 Thessalonians where, where Paul's talking about the last days. And he's talking in his passage in, in, in chapter 2 about a very wicked person who will arise on the earth. 
and he's going to um, be very terrible, and he's going to oppress people, especially he's going to oppress Christians and persecute Christians, and he's called in uh, Thessalonians, he's called the son of destruction or the lawless one. Or elsewhere in the New Testament, uh, as many people think, this is talking about the Antichrist. And, and Paul talks about this in this passage, his rise to power, how he's going to start proclaiming himself to be God above all other gods, even Yahweh, and he's going to trick the world. And John actually talks about him in 1 John 2.18. He says, he actually says, you know what? Many Antichrists are going to come. Many Antichrists have already come. And, and we think of that, and we, there's leaders that, that who have raised themselves up already. We've seen that many times. Leaders who, uh, you know, raised themselves up above God, and they've just spewed evil and violence onto this earth. People like Hitler and, and Stalin and Nero. And, but John and Paul both say that in the end, the very last days, the very end, things are going to ramp up to like a fever pitch in this world. And Satan is going to be fully loosed upon this earth and allowed to freely devour and persecute the church. And there's going to be the restrainer that will be taken away and then the Antichrist will come. And so I know um, right away when I'm saying that, there's probably some of you out there like, oh, this doesn't really fit in with my end times way of things. Now, the way that I've ordered this all, and I'm just trying to be as simple as possible with it. There, there's a lot of things that depend on how you understand and you interpret and how you read certain passages in the Bible, um, in Revelation and Daniel and different places. And, and uh, you know, especially Revelation 20, how you understand Revelation 19 and 20. Um, Revelation 20 talks about the thousand year reign, the millennial reign of Jesus, but I'm going to leave all that for another day. It is way too much. Uh, I've actually thought, kind of considering preaching on some of that and understanding the different views on the, on the millennium and Revelation and going off there um, next week, possibly, or um, when I get my uh, video blog TV show where, that we're going to start up. I may do that as a discussion thing uh, for some of us and, and just kind of thinking through it and, and seeing some of the different viewpoints. Anyhow, that's not for today, but the point is for today to think about this. That this is clear in the Bible that things, that all evil is going to ramp up, ramp up like this at an increasing pace into this fever pitch even to things like natural disasters and, and violence around the world and rumors of wars and all that kind of stuff. And Satan is going to do his worst against us. And right when all seems to be lost, what's going to be spoken of in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 4, and also referenced by Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 12, is this is going to happen. And I'm just going to read Paul's version here. He says, Right at the, the very end here, it says, then the lawless one will be revealed. All of a sudden, on the stage is going to come the Antichrist. He's going to be revealed. And it, and doesn't, it, it compresses everything down what's going to happen. He says, then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus Christ will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The second coming. And the point of this, the point of this all, why I'm talking about this, the point of verse 4 in, in Isaiah 11, and the point of the prophecies of the Antichrist across the Bible, all this end time stuff, is that there is going to be a day in which Jesus will come back. It's described also by Jesus in Matthew 24 as this event that's going to be seen by all across the whole world. And in Revelation, and when he comes back, he's described as this figure on a white horse whom people call faithful and true, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And on this specific day in history, Jesus will slay the lawless one with the breath of his mouth. And the sword 
that Jesus Christ had already thrust into the heart of sin and evil and death 2,000 years ago. Did you know that? That, that evil has already been dealt the death blow. Satan and evil have already got the sword in their heart. On the cross, and when Jesus rose from the dead, when, when he suffered, when Jesus suffered in our place for our sin that we did, that he took upon himself for paying for all the wrong things that we've done and to erase our shame and to raise us up to be seated in heavenly realms with him. When Jesus took to the cross on that day and he died, he put the sword into the heart of evil. And so what's going to happen when he comes back? He's going to take that sword. It's almost like the last 2,000 years have been slow-mo where he shoved the sword in and there's just been this like pause for 2,000 years. And when he comes back, he's going to take that sword and he's going to twist it in the heart of evil. And you know, and evil is going to be like, all I could think about today is that evil is, going to, is like Goliath in the Old Testament. The most unbeatable enemy. Everybody was terrified of Goliath. It can't be beaten. It can't be erased. It's, he, he, Goliath is such a huge problem. Jesus is going to turn the sword in the heart of evil. Just like Goliath, evil will come toppling down to the ground. And Jesus, just like David, is going to cut off the head of evil. And he's going to remove the fangs of that ancient serpent, the devil. As Revelation 20.10 20, says, prophesies that the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire. He's going to be thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And in Isaiah, we see what happens next. The sin which started this whole thing way back in the Garden of Eden where sin entered the world and then death through sin. Sin and death is going to be washed into oblivion. And the earth is going to be restored and remade. And how this all plays out and the timing. Hey, I don't understand all that. I think, I think anybody who says they got this all figured out is, well, be wary of somebody who has all the answers to end times. That's all I got to say. But we do our best to study it. But we know from Isaiah 11 that death and sadness is going to be a faint memory. Verse 6 says, talks a little bit, just a little window into that. The wolf is going to lie down and live with a lamb. Think about that. A wolf, a super hungry wolf living with a little tasty lamb, which normally he would think is tasty. They just think that, that would never happen. A leopard shall lie down with a young goat. Meaning there's going to be no more death. You know, and, and I love watching, I actually really love watching nature shows on, on things like National Geographic and, and, and you know, Planet Earth or whatever, all these nature shows. I love watching it because God's creation is amazing. His, his creation is so creative. God is so creative. And, and, and you know, you might watch a nature show and you see the, in uh, the African plains or something, the deer and the gazelle just all leaping along so gracefully but you know unfortunately when you watch those shows we know if you stay around long enough through the show it ends up turning really dark it's inevitable there always ends up being some 20 foot crocodile which comes out of the water all of a sudden and grabs one of the gazelles or it's a baby gazelle and then in horror we got to cover the kid's eyes and and change the animal before the bloodbath ensues yeah, depressing. Those shows always end like that. And then the narrator says something clever like, and, and thus the circle of life continues or something like that. Well, you know what Isaiah is telling us about the heart of God today? 
God is saying, no more of that. No more. I'm going to put the problem of evil and death to death. There's going to be no more quote-unquote circle of life. No more bad endings on Animal Planet. No more bad news on CNN. No more cancer. No more COVID. No more saying goodbye to our loved ones. That's going to be over with. Jesus is putting the sword in those kinds of things. In Revelation 21, 4, it says God's going to wipe every single tear from our eyes. You know, I'm looking forward to that day when we are reunited with people like Melanie and my Uncle Jim and Vera and so many others in our church. I'll probably miss people if I say, you know, I always think of Brian Pendrack and Nancy and I'm not, I shouldn't even say anymore because I'm going to start. All those people that we have said goodbye to in, in, in sadness and grief and tears, we are going to enjoy, be reunited with them, and together with them, we're all going to see King Jesus face to face. And as verse 9 says, the earth is going to be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In some ways, you know, I was thinking about this and, you know, I talked to somebody this week about this and, and, you know, in some ways the earth is full of the knowledge of the Lord in one way. You know, creation testifies about God. The, the earth is full of Bibles. God's word testifies about him. The Holy Spirit testifies about the man, Jesus Christ. And, and all the believers in every tribe and tongue and nation testify about God and the knowledge of God and the person of Jesus Christ. But you know what? So many hearts right now in the world, they're hard and they're not listening. But I think, you know, in, in, in a totally different and powerful and supernatural way on that day when we get to the end and we begin the new beginning. In, when the, the kingdom, right now, the kingdom of God is here, but it's not in its fullness. It's like everything's already, but not quite yet. And, and I think on that final day, and when we go forward from there, the knowledge and understanding of God and, and his spirit is so going to permeate everything in our lives and every fiber of our being and in this world that we're going to be like overwhelmed by God's love and his glory and his majesty We'll be so overwhelmed, just like how it describes, like we're going to be in an ocean of God's love and glory. We, don't, we can't even wrap our minds. We don't know what that's like. We can't compare it to anything. To be in the ocean of God's love. And so now as we're going to take communion, I just, I just want to ask you today, is this not an awesome hope? Is this not an awesome promise? You know, Christians, I know it's tough times, but we've got to take heart. We don't grieve and we don't, we aren't sad. We can be grieve and be sad, but not like people who have no hope. Jesus is faithful and he's already done the hardest thing. He already went to the cross on your behalf. He's taken away the sting and victory of death. And, and, and whatever crappy things you got to go through in this life, take heart. Because we are in the very last of the last days. <laughs> Did you know that? They said, Peter and, and all kinds of people in the New Testament call it the last days back then. We're in the last of the last days. And evil's days are short and they are numbered. And I believe with all my heart that the kingdom is so much closer than we have any clue about, than we can even realize. It's right here. It's like right here and the curtain's going to be lifted 
very soon, I believe. So take heart. And you know what? If you, you, you're not, you haven't really been a believer or a follower of Jesus, you can take heart too. Because this hope, this promise that we're talking about today and everything that it entails, it's not something that you can attain. It's a gift. You can't attain it. You can only receive it. Romans 10.9 says simply this. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And the key there is not head knowledge, it's heart knowledge. If you believe in your heart that Jesus is who he says he was, and he's raised from the dead, and he's at the right hand of God, then you will follow him. That's just what happens to people who believe. So let's praise God for this. As, as you sing in your heart, be honest and, and praise and worship God for this hope that we have. This is, this is the most amazing news that you could ever receive. And, and so just, uh, we're going we're gonna to sing a song now, and then after this song, we'll take communion all together. Even though we're separate, it's the weirdest thing to take communion when I'm not with you, but we can do it anyways.
Today I'm going to be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The Apostle Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's what we do. We remember and we will proclaim. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. So that's why I always say, you know, like in our heart, we just, just you know, don't fool around. Don't just do this as religion, as some, something that you got to do and your mind is elsewhere. In our heart, remember, remember Jesus. He's done the hardest part. Remember what he did out of love for you and I. And, and you know, if, you, if you're not at the point where you're a believer yet, you don't take communion. All, all you have to do is simply, you know, confess with your mouth and turn your heart to Jesus. Believe in your heart. And yes, then take communion. It's not some big thing climbing a ladder, but if, if you don't feel you, you're there yet and you, you don't quite believe, then don't take communion. Because it says that if anybody does that, they drink judgment upon themselves. And uh, so before we, before we eat and drink, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just confess to you right now how often my, my heart's like, skipping around and, and not and so uh, kind of like a puppy I guess my heart is like going this way and that and and oftentimes you know it's we're not remembering you and we're not remembering what it is that you've given us Lord the, in, in the, the mystery the amazing mystery and the hope of the gospel the fact that you, God, that you died for us. And Lord, I just pray that as we remember, Lord, that we would, that you would take us through this week, Lord. And we just pray to you and we, and we just give thanks to you, God. I'm just so thankful that you care about a sinner like me. I'm just thankful for what you did and I pray we pray collectively as a church to give, give him thanks God and and we ask that our lives going forward here would proclaim our gratitude and proclaim our hope the fact that you did die for us and that you did rise again and I just ask these things in Jesus name we pray amen you may drink and eat.